Greetings, I'm Steve. You're watching Blessed Hope Forever. Our Father and our God, we stand in thy presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful now for the privilege and the opportunity to feast together upon thy word. We commit the hour to, to you, asking that the Holy Spirit would teach us, strip away that which is carnal, that which is foolish, that which is contrary to thy word, but just seal to our hearts the truth that we so desperately need that we together might grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. For it's in His name we pray. Amen. We are studying together 2 Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we were crossing the bridge from chapter 9 to chapter 10. We've been looking in the last two chapters at an operation of God's grace. We saw seven different terms used to illustrate and describe this grace. In fact, uh, we found it called grace, uh, fellowship, ministry, and equality, and abundance, a blessing, and a service. And in our present study, we're looking at the ministry of this service. We were told in the 12th verse of chapter 9 that this service does two things. One is it supplies or it makes up that which is lacking on the part of the saints. And we have seen early in the study that we're not looking at money. And we're not looking at any particular material benefit, but that we're looking at an operation of the grace of God, which meets the needs on both parts, both, both giver and receiver. A physical manifestation of the reality of our relationship with Jesus Christ. It may be money, it may be time, it may be effort, but it does two things. It meets the need of the giver as well as the need of the receiver. And in addition to that, when it says that it supplies the want of the saints, I don't think that we ought to conclude that that, that want is, is only unilateral, that, that that which is lacking in some saints is supplied by other saints. That's not what the verse says. The verse indicates very clearly that, that this practical exercise of the grace of God works both ways. For the one who gives, he has something lacking. And the one who receives has something lacking. And the exercise of this service meets both needs. In addition to that, it results in uh, many thanksgivings to God. Verse 12, and, and thanksgiving is an indispensable part of the Christian experience, I think uh, you and I would both have to agree on that. Over and over again, the Holy Spirit urges us to give thanks, and surely we're adult enough to realize that that giving thanks is not some tacit 
you know, well, thanks, you know, but a real intelligent grasp of the sovereignty of God, the love of God, and the grace of God that, that He is, in fact, dealing in our lives for our good. God told the Israelites that when He, when he brought His judgments against them, He did that in order that, that they might know that He was their God and that they might derive comfort from that knowledge and realize that God works for their good. I think we're seeing the same thing right here. We need to learn that if we are truly giving thanks, that means that we truly recognize God's control, God's sovereignty, God's direction in our life, and that we can honestly, from the heart, give thanks for the pain, for the suffering, the hardships, the trials, whatever it might be. And so the second result of this, not only, not only meeting the bilateral needs of the saints, is, is thanksgiving to God. Uh, verse 13, and, the, and, and, and that, I believe, is where we left off last time we were together here. While... Now, you can scratch that word while. It's, it's not there in the authorized text or the, the Greek. By means of proving this ministry, bringing, bringing glory to the true God, to the one real God, the one true God, for your true confession, your confession of the gospel of Christ. You read that verse and surely the inference is clear that there is something other than a true confession of the gospel of Christ. You know, most people know the idioms. Most people know the cliches. It's very difficult from one's language to decide what he really understands about Jesus Christ. You know, I talk to, to Christians all the time who don't make a true confession of the gospel of Christ. It's, a, it's an extremely easy thing, either, either from the academic standpoint or the non-committal standpoint, to know the language and not the reality of the finished work of Jesus Christ. The thanksgiving is tested by a true confession of the gospel of Christ that His work is finished, that in fact, Jesus did pay it all, that we belong to Him, that we are a gift from God the Father to God the Son, so that our participation in any practical expression of the grace of God is from the heart, in truth. And if you have the authorized version, I'm not exactly sure what your Bible might say there. Your liberal distribution. Your liberal distribution. Because the translators, as I must point out, the preconceptions of the translator many times shows up in, in his rendering of the text. If we are totally, if we are absolutely, completely predisposed to the fact that this is an offering of hard cash given the needy Christians by wealthy Christians. And boy, those, those wealthy Christians, you know, they ought to really dig down deep in their pockets and give. If that's the way that we're going to take this passage, if we're going to hold it as some kind of a, a club over those who, who have... Uh, who, who have, in order that they might give to those who have not, you know, the haves and the have-nots. You know, in fact, as I listen to, you know, some of the extremes on that, it almost seems to me that all of you rich people, you ought to give everything that you have to the poor, and then the poor would now be the rich, 
And then what they ought to do is give it back to you. And it looks to me like some people take this passage as, well, we ought, we ought to just be passing money back and forth all the time so that the rich and the poor are, are vacillating. I don't believe there's any emphasis in this passage at all about how much you give. In fact, the Holy Spirit has gone out of His way to say, you know, hey, whatever you've decided ahead of time, that's what you do. And you do it for the Lord, not by constraint, not out of guilt, not out of pressure from anybody. But what you have decided to do before the Lord, that's what you ought to do. That liberal distribution is a prejudice of the translator that what we're talking about here is a gift of money. The Greek would say your purposeful fellowship, your, your single-minded fellowship with them and with all. If in fact the Holy Spirit uh, had meant to emphasize the giving of cash or, or whatever was given and, and being sent to Jerusalem, surely He wouldn't have said with all or to all uh, my Bible says, your liberal distribution unto them and, and unto all men. All men. There isn't any idea whatsoever that any offering was taken to give to every man. That just absolutely violates the context of this passage. The Greek says, with a single-minded fellowship with them and with all. You know, and people tend to get just a little bit disturbed when somebody suggests that, that the all is a limited all. Folks, all is a word that is always limited. If you're talking about all the oil in the world, you know, you've limited it to oil. If you're talking about all the money in the world, you've limited that to, to money. If you're talking about all the men in the world, you've limited that to to men, well, that leaves out women and children. This simply says, to all. I believe the all is limited to the family and the household of God. I've, I've, I've warned folks against the, the, the importance of context or the tragedy of ignoring context. You know, that your single-minded fellowship is with God's children with God's family. And so this thanksgiving is tested by, first of all, it's tested by a true confession of the gospel of Christ, is what my text says. And secondly, a single-minded, a purposeful fellowship with believers. I think we need to recognize that true fellowship with believers requires purpose, you know, you may think it's, it's easier to find fellowship with non-believers, and, and of course, in many cases, that's true. Absolutely true. I don't believe the Holy Spirit has ever indicated that Christians are easy to love. In fact, just the, the reverse. It seems apparent, at least to me, in the Scriptures, that the family and the household of God are, in fact, hard to love. It is inconceivable that Christ would save some people. You know, I think he had, I think he saved me, but some of them others, I, I'm not. Wow, I'm not so sure about. And I believe the Holy Spirit is not pulling any punches. Very straightforward, indicating to you and me that true fellowship with believers—that's what results in thanksgiving and praise to God. And, and it requires purpose, a single-minded endeavor. And that single-mindedness that, that we see here in the text is based on the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we truly love Christ, then it doesn't seem unreasonable that we ought to truly love what Christ loves. 
a purposeful fellowship with them and with all. And I believe that's all believers. Your, your authorized version has, has men there, uh, but they have it italicized because they don't know either. You know, I, folks, I don't know. I'm, I'm simply suggesting that I believe in the context, the word all means all the family and the household of God. Uh, and last of all, this thanksgiving to God and the ministry of the service has another benefit. And is that is that they pray for you just as you were praying for them. The uh, casual consideration would be that they have a, a need, so we pray for them. Uh, they have this deep need, and we pray for them. But isn't it amazing, dearly beloved, isn't it really that they also pray for you? That they have a desire of fellowship with you because of the exceeding grace of God which is in you. Which, I don't know. It's not you. It's, it's the gift of the grace of God that brings about this bond of fellowship between believers, not something that you've done. Surely, folks, the Holy Spirit is telling us very bluntly that the thanksgiving should not be based upon your production. I think we need to recognize uh, the modern Christian testimony. Uh, we're all familiar with it. Right? You know, here you got two men. You know, who gave, give stand up. They give their testimony. The man that smoked, he gave his testimony about how the Lord had delivered him from alcohol. And the man who smelled of alcohol, he gave his testimony and how the Lord had delivered him from cigarettes. And well, any number of illustrations can be given where the non-believer, the one who has nothing to do with God, the who, who hates God, the grace of God, or he knows, he knows nothing about the grace of God or the finished work of Christ, but he, he, could, he could duplicate exactly the same testimony? I don't think so. I believe that the Holy Spirit is arguing against that. I believe there is a true confession of the gospel of Christ, a willful, purposeful fellowship with believers and a recognizing of the grace of God for which you give th thanks to God. And that is absolutely impossible to counterfeit or duplicate from any human uh, experience. That's why I think the chapter ends with that simple verse. I put that in quotes, simple verse. Thanks be to the one true God for his indescribable gift. And once again, the easiest thing to do from the, the human standpoint is now to, to just launch into you know, a tirade or a deep emotional sermon that, that well, since God gave, since God gave this, just, just think how you ought to give. You know, how can I do less than give him my best after all he's done for me or, or however that sanctified him goes? There is always the tendency to, to say, you know, well, look, look what God did. Think what I ought to do. You know, we had the same thing back in, uh, in verse 9 of, of chapter 8. You know, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ as though He was rich, yet for your sakes He became poor. So all, all of you rich people, whoever you might be in this congregation, I, I don't know how you define rich. Rich to me as well as, as anybody who's got more money than I do. You know, but all of you rich people ought to become poor. You know, Christ did. So you ought to. And, and that... That is a wrong application of the verse. Thanks be unto God for His unspeakable gift. Indescribable, the Greek says. Folks, listen to me. That verse is not there in order to excite you to greater giving, but to excite you to greater praise. 
to recognize that what, what we've been studying is the result of something God gave, not something people did. You know, we could easily take these, these two chapters and put all the glory on Paul, put all the glory on the believers at Corinth, Galatia, Thessalonica, Philippi, all of these believers who went together and made some great offering. You know, if that's in fact what they did, we could spend a lot of time bringing praise and glory to those and that did that, and well, that'd be wrong. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you have to agree that that would be wrong? The, the chapter was not given to illustrate a lapse in the life of Paul or some, or some great exercise on the part of believers, but to show a practical illustration of the gift of God's grace. And the verse that closes the chapter is not a verse to excite you to greater giving or greater service, but greater praise. Thanks be unto God for His indescribable gift. How would one describe the grace of God? Well, people have tried. I think I've tried. Grace. That's that well we grace that's God's riches at Christ's expense and you know and once we come up with some kind of tricky expression like that you know we're very prone to quit thinking you have God's riches at Christ's expense it, it, folks if that's all we know of the term grace we we know very little about grace it's interesting uh, as one reads you know the word where God expects, He expects us to know things unknowable. We have a, an indescribable gift. We have a peace that passes understanding. We have a joy unspeakable. You know, these are funny terms. Is it not possible that the Holy Spirit is indicating to us that no matter how far we go, we'll never, never fathom all of the depths of the peace, the joy, the rest, the grace that is ours in Christ that our Heavenly Father has, has given to us. That's not, that's not to suggest in any way that, that we should not study or that we should not meditate. You know, oh, wow, I know what that means. I never have to study it again because I know what grace means. I know what it means. So that, such is not the case in the Word of God. I think that what the Holy Spirit is saying is no matter how much you study the concept of God's grace, you'll never get there. But you'll learn more and more and more. It is infinite in its context. Rather than, rather than saying that we shouldn't study it at, at all, means that, that we can study it indefinitely and never plumb its depths. It's kind of like the Marianas Trench or deeper. You know, the, the same is true of his joy, of his peace. I wonder how many Christians give thanks unto God for his indescribable gift. As we think of the grace of God, God speaks to Israel and he says that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring four judgments in your land and I'm going to do that because I love you because I want you to know that I love you that I'm I'm establishing my own people and that you're going to find out that what I'm doing is for your good for your ultimate good it may not always seem pleasant but it's for your good it seems amazing to me that God has to bring difficulty in order for us to know that yet I believe that's true in the Christian life if I believe anything, I believe that that's true in the Christian life. We, we have all kinds of books on, you know, if you, if, you, if you just live right with God, you know, you know, everything's super, you know, just saddle up beside God, put your hand in His and, and live faithfully, and man, oh man, you just, you just never have any problems. You've got to be kidding. 
you know, you got this genie in a bottle, you know, if you just rub it just right, you know. Uh, rub it any time and you can get anything you want. And somehow we have an artificial idea of what it means to live the Christian life. I believe the scriptural account clearly indicates that God will patiently knock out from beneath us one by one those supports, those, those artificial supports that we have built until we learn to trust Him and Him. Trust in Him and Him alone over and over and over again. It's apparent that, that if I am going to honestly give thanks for His indescribable gift, it must come through, well, we don't want to say it, think it, but suffering, okay? It is apparent in the study of the last two chapters that there has been suffering, there has been a need on the part of believers and an urgency on the part of others to meet that need. And the Holy Spirit has simply indicated that this is all a result of the grace of God and that this operation is an operation that supplies things lacking on both sides. Both sides. Those who are being geared up to supply the need and those who are to receive the need. All of it. Not because Rome has, has done something, or that the Jewish leaders have done something, or that, or that, or that somebody has made a, a foolish financial mistake. All of it because of God's grace to provide things lacking in the life of the believer. No wonder the chapter ends Thanks be unto God for His indescribable gift. So now we enter into the 10th chapter. I do know that early Christians, you know, the thing that was unique within early Christianity was their love for one another. I know that the Lord Jesus Christ says, Hereby shall all men know that you are my disciples by your love one for another. It is utterly amazing to me how absent from every other religion in the world is the concept of love. You don't enter into Buddhism with any concept of love for one another. You don't enter into Confucianism without any, with, with any concept of love for one another. You don't enter into to paganism or anything else. It, if there is any concept of love in a false religion, it was stolen from the Scriptures. I believe true love, one for another, Christian love for one another is unique to Christianity. It cannot be duplicated. And in, in addition to that, to me, a great difference between the one who has a true confession of the gospel of Christ, a thing that, a thing that can't be duplicated, is ascribing the glory to God resting in the finished work of Christ and the fact that God knows what He's doing I don't think that that's something that can be duplicated. Now, I don't, I don't know if that, whether that helps your, in your thinking or not. My Bible says, Hereby shall all men know that you're my disciples in that you have love one for another. And that, can't, that cannot, folks, be the, the squishy kind of love that's that, well sung about in country music but a scriptural love that is based on an absolutely unselfish concept of love. I think a true love for the Word of God is unique. I think there are many who study it academically, love it, they love it from an academic standpoint, but not from a standpoint of reality. So we made it to chapter 10. 
I don't believe there's any great change in, in subject matter. I think the Holy Spirit is going right on with His message to the believers at Corinth. You know, they've been a very carnal group of believers. The Holy Spirit is, has, has turned about that carnality by a, a true approach to the Word of God. That's how you do it. Long ago, uh, the uh, what word should I use? The, the ecclesiastical system concluded that, that that way won't work. You know, the correct way to fight carnality is to have a, a, a loyalty pledge, let's see, a statement of faith, a creed, uh, an established uh, practice. Uh, you, know, you know, good Christians don't, and then, and then we list all these things. You know, if you do any of these things, you can't sing in a choir or teach Sunday school class or, or whatever. And if you do do these things, you are by far, in a way, a spiritual believer. It's amazing that a church which professes to know Jesus Christ and has the Scriptures that knows law doesn't work, you know, whatever, fall back to law. That happened to the Galatians. Oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. How can it possibly be that when Jesus Christ was openly manifested among you, you'd fall back to law? Which is basically amounts to a falling from grace. But that, folks, is the popular way. If we're going to have to solve, you know, we need to solve this sin problem. And if we're going to have to solve the sin problem, we've got to do it with law. Surely the Word of God says from the Christian standpoint, it's grace. It's the Word of God. What was said to Corinth is, you are my people, I love you, I chose you unto myself, I'm a God of comfort. Now here are some of the things which are displeasing to me. But no law is laid down whatsoever. Tremendous revival at Corinth. The, the second epistle written to establish the grace of God, the comfort of God, and the practical outworking of the grace of God. However, there are still those at Corinth who would either be legalistic or run down this true approach to the Word of God that Paul's talking about. This is what we're going to see in the text. What, what we've seen in chapters 8 and 9 is not a disjointed uh, section from the theme of the epistle, but rather a practical expression of the grace of God that has been manifest in the believers at Corinth. Now I, Paul, myself, very unusual for the Holy Spirit to do that, we again come back to, well, you know, did Paul write it or did the Holy Spirit write it? Well, you know where I stand on that. You know, without any question, Paul wrote it, and without any question, the Holy Spirit wrote it. If this, folks, is not the Word of God, we're wasting our time. If, on the other hand, this is the Word of God, then we have a, a marvelous opportunity to study that which God has given us. Verse 1, chapter 10. Now I, Paul, myself, beseech, the word is exhort, you know, exhort you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. The word beseech is, is para, para kalo or parakalo. It means to call alongside. You're familiar with the word paraclete, you know, comforter, one who comes alongside to comfort. I beseech you by means of the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, 
who in presence am base among you, but being absent am bold towards you. My, my authorized version says, uh, you saw this in chapter 6, is the word cast down, cast down among you, but, but being absent and confident towards you. It's interesting that his confidence is by means of the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. That's not the way the carnal mind wants to do it. It's, it's not by meekness and gentleness. It's by law and it's by force. If we're going to correct an evil, we correct it forcibly. You know, we pass some law. We pass a law. We, 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 we level judgment. But God doesn't do that. God doesn't do that. And folks, I praise God every day for the reminders of His grace and His love. I can't imagine that He would do less than destroy me and, and I read of the meekness and the gentleness of Christ. Look at the concept of, of meekness in, in the Word of God and, and you'll find, you know, for example, that, that Moses was the meekest of all men. Man, I mean, you know, well, he, he, didn't, he didn't sound very meek before Pharaoh. He didn't, he didn't sound meek before the children of Israel. He, he didn't sound meek, you know, when he, when he struck the rock, but, but Moses was 80 years old, you know, when he started. If we look at, at the concept of meekness, it's a concept which gives God all the glory, which points always to God, not to Moses. Moses was constantly saying that we're not looking at Moses, but we're looking at the Jehovah God. I'm sent by the great I Am. And all through the Word of God, the man who is meek is the man who points you to God, who gives God the glory, all the glory, all the power, the direction. Our Lord Jesus Christ, dearly beloved, our Lord and Savior said that He came to do the will of the Father. Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do Thy will, O God. He emptied Himself, became obedient unto death, not only unto death, but the death of judgment, the death of the cross, and the gentleness of Christ. Well, one could suggest that he didn't sound very gentle when he drove them out of the temple, nor when he des described the true nature and the character of those who were the most religious leader leaders of his time, uh, religious leaders at that time. The concept of gentleness is not one who allows himself to be walked over, but one who deals in love with his own. It is through the grace and the love of God that you and I stand where we do. And God is never in a hurry, folks. You will not find from Genesis Genesis to Revelation, any indication whatsoever that God was agitated or in a hurry. You know, the only possible case that I can come up with is when He ran to meet the prodigal son. You know, if the Father there is a type of God, and I believe that He is, then the only time I see God in a hurry is to gather me back in His arms. Surely the Lord Jesus Christ and His sacrifice on the cross was, was proposed before Adam was created. You know, the length of time that went by, you know, we're, we're, not, we're unable to define. And then slowly, through the womb of the Virgin Mary, through 30 years of, of growth, the Lord Jesus Christ appears on the scene. I see no agitation. No, no hurry on the part of God. He deals with us gently. He leads us along. It's by the, 
the meekness and the gentleness of Christ, not by condemnation, not by the rod of judgment or, or of law that he calls us to his side. I'm cast down among you. However, when I'm away from you, I have a high confidence because of that meekness and gentleness of Christ, says Paul. Therefore, I implore you, the word, word beseech, if you have the authorized version, I, I entreat you, uh, the, the beseech in verse 1 was to call you to the same mental attitude you know, to one of cooperation, to one of agreements. The word in the second verse is a word to entreat you. I entreat you in order that when I come, I don't need to exercise the confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. I have a boldness which I will use against those who would charge this walk as a walk of carnality. And folks, you need to meditate on that. People are not changed with, uh, or by, through law. People, and we're not charged with carnality when when they, they, they have the Christian do's and don'ts. I mean those are very strict Christians. They don't dance, they don't cuss, they don't smoke. We know the we know the story. They don't play cards, they don't bowl, they don't use lipstick, they don't go to the beauty parlor, you know. Most churches that, that I've been in that don't go to the beauty parlor, the women all wear hats. We we call those strict Christians. We call them conservative and dedicated and, and spiritual. You know, the ones who are carnal are the ones who are living in, in liberty. Isn't it amazing that there would be those who would suggest that a focus on Christ, uh, a focus on His grace and love and election and, and comfort and joy is carnality? What, what should have been written or legalistic do's and don'ts so that this problem of sin could be solved. We've got to solve that sin problem. Imagine the charge of carnality against a presentation of the grace of God in Corinth. And now imagine the same today, because that's true today. Well, I'm out of time. We'll think more about that, the Lord willing, next week. I love you all. I truly do. Rest in Him. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.